Hello and welcome to this video about matrix data structures and how to represent a matrix in a computer. In this video, we'll learn how to write a computer program that can find the kernel of a matrix, that is, the set of all possible vectors that give zero as a solution when multiplied on the right of a matrix. We'll use this matrix as an example. If the matrix has a determinant of zero, then the kernel will contain not only the zero vector as a solution. So this is the reduced row echelon form of this matrix, which has the same kernel as this matrix that we've just reduced. This is the Gaussian matrix of A, which contains all of the row operations required to get it into reduced row echelon form. It would be its inverse if its reduced row echelon form was the identity matrix. And here is the kernel of this matrix A, which contains three linearly independent column vectors, which means that adding all of any multiples of these vectors would span a three-dimensional space. This is a very compact and powerful way to store these three vectors. We'll learn how to calculate it from the matrix A. This is the equation describing the relationship between a matrix and its Gaussian and reduced row echelon form matrices. And we've substituted the examples given at the beginning. Now supposing that B is a vector in the kernel of A. Then multiplying this vector by the matrix would give us zero. But matrices can have zero divisors, not like the numbers that we're used to. We can multiply both sides of this equation by the Gaussian matrix of A, which would give us the reduced row echelon form of A on the left hand side and zero on the right hand side. Multiplication of a zero vector by a matrix will always give us the zero vector back. And so this is what this matrix looks like in this example. I'll just rewrite these equations at the top. It's complicated to explain how to find the kernel of a matrix, but here's the general idea. These numbers have to match up with each other. The 1 in the matrix matches up with the minus 5 in the vector, and the 1 in the vector matches up with the 5 in the matrix, to cancel each other out to make 0. And the rest of these numbers in the column vector and matrix row meet up with zeros so that they all multiply by each other to make zero. So that's the idea of how to find the kernel of a matrix. So now to create code to find the kernel of a matrix, we'll declare the function with its internal variables. We'll also copy the matrix A that we want to find the kernel of into C, because this code will turn A into reduced row echelon form, which will destroy it so we can retrieve it later to use it again. So this line reduces A into reduced row echelon form, and since A has a kernel which contains more than the zero vector, its reduced row echelon form won't be the identity matrix. This function destroys what A originally was, so we copied A to another matrix, so that we could get it back again. So we'll search out both all of the pivot and non-pivot columns this time, but we'll use a similar process to that used by the getImage function. We'll reset these two indexing variables here, and we need two this time for finding the kernel. Now to create a loop to look at every column of A. We'll check that each column is a pivot column. We'll assume that it is until we can find a reason why it isn't like that there's a number like 2 or 3 in it. We'll use this boolean variable to see if each column is a pivot column. We'll loop through every row in each column, and we'll get the location for each element in each row. And these lines of code check that there is a 1 and 0 in each of the correct locations. Now, if after this loop is over, we find that this column isn't a pivot column, We'll insert the column number into this array variable and increment the location in this array. And if it is a pivot column, we'll increment this indexing variable telling us which row we should find the next one at and insert this column into this array. So we're finding two arrays of columns, one for pivot columns and another one for non-pivot columns.
Then after this loop is over, we can set the dimensions of this matrix that stores all of the vectors in the kernel of A, and we can set these global variables like the nullity and rank. We'll reset this kernel matrix to be all zeros, because we possibly won't set each entry to be a number in the next part of the program. And if it isn't set to be anything in particular, then it will be set to be zero. Now to create a loop to set all of the vectors in the kernel of A that we'll calculate. We'll get the location of the column of A that contains the ith kernel vector of A. We'll loop through all of the rows of this vector. And we'll set all of the entries of this vector to be the negatives of all the entries in this column of A but we won't insert them into the same rows. We've got to do it in this special way. Then we'll add a 1 to this column. The row of this 1 is equal to the column of the vector of A that we just copied. And then finally, after having calculated the kernel of A, we'll retrieve the original value of A. Now for some theory on how to find a random vector in the kernel. So this is what a generalized kernel looks like with m columns of column vectors. So a random vector from this kernel would be the sum of each column multiplied by a random number. We'll call these random numbers r1 to rm. So this is what a random vector in the kernel would look like in this example. And we can pack this equation up into this neater matrix equation. Now to create a function to get a random vector in the kernel of A. We'll declare the function with all of its internal variables. We'll set the dimensions of the vector b, which is our random kernel vector. It will only have one column, so it's a column vector. We'll set all of the entries of b to be zero. We'll create a loop to look at every column of the matrix that stores each kernel vector. So we're looking at each column vector in the kernel. We'll get a random number from 10 to minus 10, and this number is not equal to zero. We'll loop through every entry in a particular kernel vector. We'll add a random number r times the ith kernel vector to b, which will give us a random vector in the whole kernel space. Now to study some theory of how to test if a vector is in the kernel of a matrix. We'll write these equations again that we constructed last time. If B is in the kernel, then it should satisfy this equation, giving a column of zeros as the product. If it doesn't return a column of zeros, then it isn't in the kernel. This equation would also be true. The original matrix A would multiply by B to also give a column of zeros. So to test if B is in the kernel, it isn't necessary to do any other calculation than to multiply this matrix by this vector. Now to create this function, which tells the user whether or not a particular vector b is in the kernel of matrix A. We'll declare the function with all of its internal variables. We'll set the main return variable to be true, and find an occasion for it to be false. We'll multiply matrices A and B in this order, and place the product into C, which should be a column vector. We'll round the vector C to make all of the tiny numbers equal to zero, so that the equality functions will work properly. We'll create this loop to look at every entry in C. If B is in the kernel of A, then C should be the zero vector, with every entry being zero. We'll check for that here. And here is where we'll return the return variable, saying whether or not B is in the kernel of A. So I hope that you have found this video to be helpful, educational, and maybe even enjoyable. Please click like and subscribe if you did. Feel free to share this video. Please leave some helpful thoughts in the comments. And thanks a lot for watching.